Good morning. I hope you guys are doing well, that you had a great Thanksgiving weekend. Um, we certainly did. We had a lot of time out hiking, a lot of time hiking in the woods, looking for mushrooms, uh, cooked up some weird experimental food that did not go as planned for Thanksgiving, but we had a wonderful feed anyways, and it was a blessed and beautiful weekend. And I hope yours was the same. Now, today we're going to get back together with the book of Daniel and take a look at Daniel chapter 3. And I'm going to start us in verse um, uh, 12, but I'm going to get us there. So verse chap Daniel chapter 3 starts out with this moment where Nebuchadnezzar and his people have built this huge golden uh, statue of Nebuchadnezzar himself. Now, then they, this is a monumental thing. This huge golden statue probably wasn't solid gold, probably plated gold, but still a statue that big made out of gold is a work of art and a work, a technological feat that's not small beans at all. In fact, the, the nature of the whole thing is really supposed to be very impressive. Kind of think of yourself as a, um, a technological feat, something that the world would look at and say, nobody's ever been able to do that before. So here, along lines of that, Nebuchadnezzar summons all of the leaders from all of the provinces and all the important government officials from everywhere that Babylon rules, which is pretty much everywhere. And he calls them all to the capital city to see this wonderful feat that's been accomplished. Think of it, as you will, as a combination uh, of a kind of a world trade fair combined with a a UN council meeting, something like that. But instead of the UN where everybody's an equal part, there is one emperor who runs everything and he's called everyone to come and to see that. And so people from all the provinces, hundreds of people come in and they're going to be wine and they're going to be dined. It's going to, they're going to be impressed by the grandeur of Babylon and they're going to be sent home to tell these stories and to tell the people who they serve and who they rule over how great Babylon is as a reminder and as a warning to them uh, not to mess with Babylon. Now at the height of this is the worship of this image of Nebuchadnezzar. Now remember Nebuchadnezzar isn't actually a god but what he is is he's the high king of Babylon and so he can ask them for a season to worship him according to the way that they do that. He's, he's claiming a place amongst the gods and um, demanding that kind of uh, worship. And um, it's all part and parcel of this same big publicity stunt, which is what this really is. It's a huge publicity stunt to show all of these provinces how great Babylon is, because if the ba provinces think that Babylon's great, they're going to be proud of being part of Babylon, and they're not going to rebel and cause problems for Babylon. So this is uh, a complicated moment here. And in the midst of it, the Nebuchadnezzar tells everyone, look, what I want you to do is when there's this, when the music plays, we've got this great big complex orchestra of instruments. When the music plays, I want everybody to bow down before this idol and worship it, which would not be unheard of. And for a polytheistic society, it wouldn't be a big deal because you're, you worship lots of different idols in different places and you're in Rome. So you do what the Romans do. But of course, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are there, and the question is, and what are they doing? Now, another question that often comes up with this one is, where is Daniel in this? Because it turns to Daniel's three friends, and it's a story about them. Daniel might have been back in Babylon proper, where he seems to be ruling. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, people think, were sent to some of the outlying provinces to be administrators in them. So anyways, everybody's here but Daniel, and that's where we pick up in verse 12 because of course the harps ring the music is sung everybody bows down to worship oh and one more thing if you don't worship you get tossed into a fiery furnace now this fiery furnace isn't just a fiery furnace for the sake of having a fiery furnace this is part of the technological grandeur he only it's this moment where you realize that in order to do a 90 foot statue of nebuchadnezzar you need a huge furnace to melt the gold and everything else that you're building. So here you've got oh, um, this huge furnace that's actually just like the statue. It's just as cool. It's just a technological feat. And he wants everybody to see this furnace, 
this incredibly hot and dangerous furnace because it's so much a proof of the technology of Babylon. So anybody who doesn't worship gets tossed in the furnace. Ah, there you go. That draws attention to the furnace. But of course, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these Jews, starting in verse 12, who have, you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, O king. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar sh summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lair, the harp, the pipes, and all kinds of music, right, he's got a whole orchestra set up here. If you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what god will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this manner. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes and trousers and turbans and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. When the king, then the king leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisers, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, Certainly, O king. He said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And the satraps, perfects, governors, and royal advisers crowded around them, and they saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then, Shad then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command, and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be cut into pieces and their houses turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. Then the king prom promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay, so we've got this image, and it's important for us to pick up on the story that Daniel is telling here. So here's the faithfulness of these men who understand that they have been called to worship Yahweh, even though they're in a foreign land. They've seen that Yahweh is the God who provides, the God who, is know all, who, who gives knowledge, and the God who controls history. And of course, that plays into Nebuchadnezzar's great big golden idol as well, because that was his vision. His vision was of a great, the vision God gave him was a vision of a great big statue of himself with a golden head on top. And so now he makes a big golden idol of himself. Funny how we take these things and we twist them. And so he twisted it into this kind of self-worship thing. Anyways, we'll get more to Nebuchadnezzar next uh, tomorrow because, oh, he gets some fun. So anyways, here's this great big image of Nebuchadnezzar that they won't bow down to. They're tossed into this furnace that's a uh, furnace that's hot enough to melt massive amounts of gold. Think the kind of furnace that you'd get uh, big enough for four men to stand in, standing upright at least. So a huge furnace, hot furnace, um, and a furnace that's so hot that it kills the people who are outside of it as well. They're tossed into the furnace and they are not consumed. God protects them and not only protects them, but he reveals himself to them and to Nebuchadnezzar in the midst of the fire. And now what stands out is if you look into a hot fire, these men that you'd see would be black shapes, especially if they weren't being consumed. But, um, the fourth, who we think is Jesus, who reveals himself to them there, 
um, in, in his own way, he is the, considered the angel of the Lord, the one who represents himself. This is one of those moments where we think this is a theophany. Anyways, he reveals himself as being so bright that he stands out as looking brighter than the flame, which will come into play later on. So anyways, here you've got this beautiful image of God showing um, approval to the faithfulness of these men, and these men subvert through their faithfulness to God. They, they undermine Nebuchadnezzar's whole point. His whole point is, no God can save you. I'm the strongest one there is. The gods have given me all the power. You better worship me. Um, and they test him on that. They try him and they find him wanting, which will come in the later, because he subverts all that. They subvert all that when they are tossed into his fire, his technological marvel, this, this uh, great crucible and furnace, and they walk out entirely unburned. It's like they, they, they would have been burned worse than a kitchen fire, but they're not because God is with them. So it's really a test of how strong is your God. And Yahweh proves in this moment to be profoundly stronger than even the blazing crucible of Nebuchadnezzar. And so what happens is instead of the people going home telling stories of the power of Nebuchadnezzar, they're going to go home and they're going to say, you would not believe what we saw. You would not believe the power of the, the God of Jerusalem, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. My goodness. And uh, even Nebuchadnezzar acknowledges again the, the glory of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel's God. Um, of course, he has a short memory, and we're going to see that tomorrow as well. But all of that should invite us to recognize this beautifully um, gentle and subversive way that these men act. They just simply trust their God. They walk in the midst of the flame and they do what he commands them to do, proclaiming the hope that they have in him and an obedience that is sacrificial. They recognize that they could come out of their fried chunks of meat instead of, you know, whole, but they trust their God in the end that he is worthy of that if that's what he requires of them. Christian, what a better example do we have? We have a God who rescues us from the flames. We have men who lead us into the flame, showing us that we can trust our God in the midst of it. I hope today that you walk uh, knowing, rejoicing, because you serve that God. God bless you all. Let's pray. Father, we praise you so much for the way that you love us and you care for us. We thank you, Father, for your glory. And we pray, Lord, that you would give us the words, as Paul says, when people ask us questions about the reason for our hope and our faith, that we would have confidence to speak as your spirit leads us, that we might proclaim the hope that we have in Christ. We pray, Father, that we would walk in the midst of this world, um, being here but not being part of it, but strangers in a strange land, called to a kingdom that is not our own. We are here as ambassadors. May we proclaim the hope we have in Christ, trusting in him today. Well, friends, I hope that you have a blessed and beautiful day. I hope you enjoyed that story. It was on the longer side, but um, it's a big one. And I wanted to get through that whole chapter today instead of dividing it. So uh, thank you for hanging out with me for that whole one. Uh, I'm excited for tomorrow already. We'll see you then. God bless you all. Bye-bye.